Contractually obligated. What's up, guys? My name is Mark, and this is GM Prep for my Blades in the Dark game, episode two. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize for the delay in actually starting the game. Um, I told you the last time I did GM Prep that we were doing, um, uh, what was it? Oh yeah. Well, I moved right on Thursday, uh, which was the game, the day that, I, or actually I moved on Friday and Thursday was the day we were supposed to play. I had to take the computer part the day before, et cetera, et cetera. So I moved and then my computer didn't work. So <laughs> I had to order a new motherboard that of course took several days to arrive. Um, you know, because we don't do local shopping anymore. Um, in fact, it's impossible to do local shopping anymore. And so, you know, that delayed it a week before I could get the new part in. Then, of course, I got the part and had to fuck with it multiple times in order to get it to work. But we finally got it back up and running and finally ran the game. Um, so if this is the first time you've ever tuned in to GM Prep, I will say that you should not watch this. If you haven't watched the other videos, probably there's going to be crazy spoilers, crazy spoilers. Um, uh, what else did I have in mind? Oh, technical issues. That was the other thing I wanted to mention. Um, I noticed on the recording that there were some weird, like some audio issues and some, some video bugs. Um, I think I've got those straightened out. Please let me know on this video that everything is working. I hopefully it is now. I, I tweaked a few settings and hopefully that will it will be better going forward. But for a while there it was a little weird. There was the one point in the video where you could hear like someone walking on a rickety floor. And there was only two of us that it that could have even possibly been a situation. And yet it wasn't happening i don't know it was very weird it was very loud and it was very weird it was like a ghost visited us <laughs> but i think i've got that straightened out now <laughs> so that was session one that you watched hopefully um they our group of intrepid heroes did a score and it was a very good score indeed um i <laughs> I, I was a little, you know, nice to them on the consequences uh, just because it was the first session and I was trying to do more of a, you know, like here's the game system, you know, tutorial kind of thing uh, going in. So I really wanted to get through a lot of like the, uh, the actual rules and things more so than put them in a precarious position. Um, although they rolled really, really well. And so... There was only, I mean, I looked back through the rolls right before we started this, and I think there was only like two or three rolls where there were even any consequences. They just succeeded all the time. <laughs> so things may get a little more difficult for them in the future. We shall see. Uh, next session is actually going to be downtime. So most of those rolls, you know, there won't really be hideous consequences on, but we'll see going forward. Um, wasn't a whole lot of role playing that went on in that first session either, which again is kind of to be expected. That usually happens in the first first time you run a new game, you know, because people are trying to grasp how it all works, and that's fine. Again, downtime will be where a lot of that stuff comes in. Also, if you hadn't used like you know sort of used to the XP system that Blades uses, where it is very much about you know your drives, your ambitions, your heritage, your your particular playbook, XP trigger. You know, those sorts of things. You may not have even been necessarily even playing towards those things because you don't even know about them necessarily. I, usually XP happens at the end, not in the middle when you're thinking about it. So, yeah. Um, so I guess the first thing to do is if you watched our first GM prep, my the first GM prep was you noticed... Um, that I just rolled some random dice on some random tables to come up with the starting situation and didn't really have much to go on. I just sort of rolled on the dice and went, huh, yeah, I think I have an idea. Here's my actual idea that I had. You will see that the relationship map is a little bit bigger than it was last time. I did some color coding too. I uh, color coded the PCs red 
So just, just so they stand out a little bit more. And Holtz Colburn over here is in black because he is dead. Um, <laughs> so the random stuff that I rolled last time shows up as Lord Penderin, who is a member of the Path of Echoes, he ends up hiring Holtz out of jail to kill his enemy, Preceptor Dunville, who is a member of the Church of Ecstasy. Um, to do that, he actually used Elstera Avrothi, uh, who is a member of the Aruvian Consulate. I didn't actually put the Aruvian Consulate on here yet, uh, just because I didn't see the need quite yet, but we'll see. Um, So Elstera has connections, and she is a member of the Circle of the Flame, which I also realized later, Madame Tesselin in, who is uh, Hamish's vice purveyor. So that's interesting. That could lead to some stuff. Um, but Elstera is also, uh, like I said, the Aruvian consulate, um, and they have dealings with the Red Sashes. Um, so she actually used the Red Sashes to hold out Holtz Colburn. Of course, the Red Sashes have their own leader, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, what it all boils down to is that Lord Pendrin now owes a favor to Elstera. Um, so that was like my behind the scenes machinations with what I did from that first GM prep session. And that was basically, you know, the mission that they played out was uh, finding Holtz and all of his stuff. Now, the other thing I did was I wrote down a couple other, um, I went back through the session, um, and I wrote down a bunch of questions, you know, about loose ends and things. I won't go into those now, but probably later in the video, probably later. Um, but I did also want to address my, uh, GM principles and the things that I was trying to do for the game. Uh, that being, of course, not. Uh, my first one was ask questions because I'm not very good at asking questions. So I tried to ask a lot of questions. Um, I think I did that. I think I succeeded there. Um, I, I definitely want to keep that up. But the other thing I noticed was that I had a really hard time following the other GM principle of call them by their character names. <laughs> not the player names, character names. Just for immersion's sake and all of that. I was really bad at that. I called everybody by their first name. And a lot of times I caught myself as soon as I was saying it and then changed, you know, to their character name. But it, that's still a tricky one for me. I don't know why. Um, so that's just the one I'm going to try to keep at the top of my mind. The next time I run is just refer to their, refer to the players, not the, now backwards, refer to the characters, not the players. <laughs> Uh, more. I want to try to do that more. Um, so, the one thing that we didn't do from that last session was after we did the payout and all that sort of stuff, uh, the next thing you normally do is an engagement roll, which my players decided that they wanted me to keep secret. Um, and this is just like a random event sort of deal. Uh, it's just stuff happening in the background of the game. It may relate directly to what just happened. It may just be the world is always turning. Things always go bad. Who knows? So let's roll that now. Um, first thing we got to do is we got to go over to the crew playbook and find out what their heat level is at. They are at four. All right. So that puts us on the chart. You know, the chart. I will show you that now. Look at that chart. <laughs> So we're in the middle, um, and I just need to roll a uh, a die to determine where exactly we are, and I'll do that, I guess, here in roll 20. Makes sense. Does that find the right window? Um, I guess what I'll do is I'll just roll fortune here on the on the crew. That'll make sense. Um, it's only one die, and no note, because we don't need one of them. There we go, I rolled a two. All right, so that puts us at gang trouble or questioning. 
So let's go down to read what those are. One of your, uh, your gangs or other cohorts causes trouble due to their flaws. One of your gangs or other cohorts. Hmm. You can lose face, make an example of one of the gang members, or face reprisals from the wronged party. They don't really have any other members of their gang, so that one's tough. It says, or other cohorts. Um, it, they don't really, yeah, they don't really have any cohorts yet. I know they have one missing uh, that they haven't introduced to the game yet. Shane's character, Vond, um, actually does have access to a hunting pet because he is a hound. Um, I'm sure he'll be introducing that at some point, uh, but he hasn't done that yet. And so, and it would be also weird for a hunting pet to cause trouble, maybe <laughs> due to their flaws. So what was the other thing? Or questioning. Questioning. The blue coats grab an NPC member of your crew or one of the crew's contacts to question them about your crimes. Huh. So the obvious one to say there is LaRose, but he's a member of the blue coats. I don't see that one coming up a lot, although I could totally make that work. Because one of the other things that I decided, um, let me switch to that real quick. Yeah, over here. Where did LaRose go? Look, he is the contact for, I added this line, he is a contact for the Grey Cloaks. Because the whole deal with LaRose even knowing that this assassin was out of jail was pretty much all due to the Grey Cloaks. Um, the way that happened was Lord Pendron basically bought the justice system to get Holtz out of jail. <laughs> um, and so the gray cloaks who were, you know, ousted out of the blue coats for getting involved with a different Lord and getting into, you know, some, some rough judicial dealings there ended up being all outcast out of the blue coats. Uh, they became a gang and that sort of thing. So I'm thinking that they're pretty privy to the justice system being mislaid or being uh, converted, turned towards evil ends, I guess. Right? So that's how um, LaRose even knew about the job. So I could make that work where either one of the Great Cloaks or LaRose himself, because he's working internally at maybe some cross-functionality, with it end up going bad um, where he would end up being questioned. I'm going to go ahead and write this stuff down, but I'm going to think about it. Um, questioning or gang trouble is what we ended up with. All right, cool. So um, like I said, I wrote down a whole bunch of different questions that happened during the game. Uh, some different things that happened. Um, so one of the things I've got to think about, and this is going forward, I'm not doing anything with this yet, but you will notice I added some clocks. Well, I added a clock to the board there. Um, in fact, let's just go ahead and get rid of this clock because that was um, during the mission itself. Um, I definitely think I could have ticked this clock a little bit more on some of those consequences. It, it never ended up where the guards were ever alerted, even though like the very last action was them firing weapons in the Red Sashes building. Uh, it just never ticked up quite enough. I'll be a little more aggressive on that in the future, I think. But in the meantime, we can delete it because that was for the last mission. Now, I added this Spirit Warden clock and I put it specifically on Crow's Foot because that is where they are investigating because that's where the dead bodies were that the PCs left behind. Um... So yeah, that's a it's a three clock. Um, of course, there's currently a gang war going on, which is why that clock makes a lot of sense. I mean, there the red sashes and the lamp blacks are fighting, so there was probably dead bodies anyway. But then the PCs certainly didn't help anything by throwing that in. So that's a clock that we've got running now. Um, so one thing that happened in the game was that Dunville actually lived. You know, he was the target of an assassination, but he lived. The assassin's dead. <laughs> the PCs killed him. 
that was another like rules thingy that I just wasn't quite sure about. Um, I did a group action for them all to attack the assassin. Um, I don't know if that was the right call or not. As far as like moving things along, I think it worked, but I'm not sure if that was the right call. He should have been a bigger threat. He's a tier four assassin. They're tier zero gang. They killed him really quickly. Um, granted, they did just dose him with heroin. There were four of them <laughs> attacking him. You know, I'm okay with the the sort of moving over that situation, just saying he was dead. But it probably should have been a little bit of a tougher fight. Probably. Something to think about in the future, anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that group action as a as a combat. Or doing a group action as a combat. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think it worked, but it wasn't ideal, I don't think. Anyway, Dunville lived. So now I've got to think about what Dunville is actually doing. Um, I know in the book, the Church of Ecstasy, which I screwed up that name in, in the session too. Like, here's me just telling you all the terrible things I did. Um, I don't know why I got that name confused. I didn't write down Church of Ecstasy in my notes next to Dunville. And like right above that, I had Cult of the Flame written down because Elstera was like right before there. And so I just transposed the two and screwed up the name when I was actually running the session. Regardless, Dunville lived. So I got to think about what he's doing. What was Pendrin so intent on stopping? Um, I'll probably just do, you know, like a long term project when I come up with that. Um, and then just stick it whenever I feel like it. Because that's how NPCs in this game work. <laughs> um, yeah, haven't quite decided what he's doing, but that's definitely a threat in the background. It could turn out bad for Lord Pendrin. It could turn out bad for Elstera. It could turn out bad for the city as a whole, the PCs. I don't know. I don't know. Probably has something to do with demons. Probably has something to do with demons. <laughs> So one of the other things I wrote down was since Lord Pendrin did, you know, just buy the justice system, essentially, how is that going to impact the relationship with the blue coats? Um, and then my other interesting thing out of that mission that I didn't think about when I was originally setting it up, but now I'm sort of thinking about is who are the gray cloaks and LaRose planning on selling that information to? Because that's all the PCs were supposed to get was the information. Um, they managed to kill the assassin also, which probably a smart move on their part. I think even Chris said, I don't want a tier four assassin after me. So I'm going to go ahead and kill him. Makes sense. Um, but LaRose was planning on selling that information. Probably still will sell that information to somebody. But who, who was he selling that information to? I don't know. I don't actually know. I, I may never decide. <laughs> um, so let's see. What else did I write down? Do, do, do. So they had a couple pieces of equipment that they ended up using in the game that were interesting. Um, first of all, Edland, uh, Chris's character, went and got some uh, Black Lotus uh, heroin. I don't know. Um, and then used it several times to dose people. Um, that's cool. But he got it from his enemy, which wasn't sure I did that correctly either. The weird thing was it was a flashback, but it was the very first session. Normally I would just say, okay, well, you flash back to downtime because that's an acquired asset. But there hadn't been any downtime yet. Um, so that got a little weird. Now, he did roll well enough where he got the tier plus one, which the black Lotus required. So he didn't have to like spend any money that they didn't have. I have no idea how I would have handled that. I probably would have just given it to him. Um, easy like that. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I wasn't sure exactly how that enemy relationship works. So I'm still thinking about his and Stasia's relationship. And what exactly did she do to the black tar heroine? I mean, the Black Lotus, <laughs> to make it worse for him. Uh, that was a weird devil's bargain that I did where it actually ended up being a bonus for them. But I think it I think it still makes sense because it will play out in the long term. I do entirely plan on bringing Stasia back and having some stuff happen, perhaps, <laughs> with that. Um, 
so that was one piece of equipment. The other interesting thing was Danny went into a flashback. Uh, his character, Timothy, went into a flashback. See, I'm calling him by their player's name, not the character's name. I'm doing it even now. Um, <laughs> um, he picked up one of the Red Sash swords. Did the Red Sash just want it back? Mm -hmm. Maybe. <laughs> that can definitely be something that happens. Maybe. Something to think about. Oh, uh, let's see here. Oh, the other thing that happened was there was a couple of different fortune rolls that happened um, where they, you know, ask, hey, does the, is the assassin's money here? You know, the money he made from the payment. And at the time and still, honestly, couldn't think of a good reason to say no. Like, why wouldn't it? Be there uh he's hiding out with this group maybe not all the money should have been there he should have probably invested it in something i'm sure he's a he's a tier four assassin he probably had some savings set it aside <laughs> but i just went ahead and rolled a fortune roll and they ended up finding his payment which was more than they were getting paid for the job so they ended up with a lot of money and a lot of coin walking out of this job but i'm okay with that because i know my players and i know how downtime works and so pretty sure that they're going to use it to get into more trouble um <laughs> they're going to use it to accomplish their goals in downtime they're going to spend it there they're going to um spend it to take additional downtime actions to do other role-playing stuff whatever they do so i think that money is a good investment in the role-playing honestly <laughs> um i'm not worried about them having too much money i'm pretty sure they're going to end up spending it eventually maybe not in this next session but they're they're you know, you're going to get a bad roll on a, um, you know, long-term project clock. And then you're going to end up spending three or four coin to finish it off because you want to finish it off. And that's awesome. And hey, you've got all this extra money in the bank, right? Yeah, that'll just go away. All that really does is it accelerates plots, honestly. I mean, that's how I'm seeing it. It accelerates their plots that they want to do. It accelerates any of my plots when they start, you know, acquiring those assets, going on jobs and stuff like that. Um, they finish up their long-term projects and that just leads to more plot triggers. So to me, the money was just an investment in making the plot go. Uh, so I don't really have a problem with it. <laughs> um, I know, you know, a lot of GMs will sometimes get a little wiggy where they're, you know, un overbalancing, underbalancing the monetary exchange um i think this game has enough ways to take it away from them like for instance we just rolled away the engagement the questioning um when you do the questioning the questioning um you can look you can look, look at that last line there uh, under question you can pay the blue coats blue coats off with two coin what there's two coin gone maybe potentially who knows so that's not a big deal to me. I think that'll be fine. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. Um, the engagement I've got is questioning. <sighs> I got to think about how that will affect. I mean, do we want to get into the internal politics of like the gray cloaks versus the blue coats at this point? Do, should it be La Rose? That's the contact that's brought in. I mean, that sort of just presents itself off the top of my head. Um, Oh, uh, ooh, one of the other questions I wrote down. Did the drugged Red Sash live? Because there was at least one person that they drugged and didn't kill. Uh, the one they left out in the yard. Did he live? What sort of repercussions happened from that Black Lotus that he took? I don't know. <laughs> but that is something I wrote down. Uh, something. Oh, one more thing that they actually took. From the besides the red sash sword and besides that uh the black lotus the equipment chris also took all the paperwork that uh holtz had which means that he's got a list uh essentially you know the schedule of dunville so maybe dunville could become a target for them i mean they've already got the groundwork laid essentially because they've got this paperwork all interesting things to think about maybe um so yeah um 
I think that's it for right now. Um, I've got that questioning. I'm going to think about each of their different contacts and which one I think would actually trigger more story. Um, it could be La Rose. I mean, that works for me. I mean, just sitting here thinking about it right now, that works for me. Um, but I may, I may come up with a better solution in the meantime. We'll, we'll have to see what happens in session two. Um, session two is mostly going to be downtime. Probably we'll get into explaining the rules of downtime, how that all works. Um, but I definitely think that's where the role playing is going to going to kick in because uh, they're going to have individual goals and things. And my players have played with me enough to know that I'm not necessarily going to you know push them towards a plot. Uh, the plot is mostly about what they come up with, which I think this game is ideal for. Um, not to say I'm against rolling some dice. I could actually roll some dice now to come up with their next score, but I am going to leave that fluid and let them come up with their next score, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, if I was a scaredy GM, a scaredy GM, I might, you know, prep something in the meantime, but I'm going with Kevin Crawford's advice in uh, Stars Without Number of uh, don't prep anything that's not going to be used, right? So I'm not going to prep that right now. I may end up rolling right then in the game to decide what the next score is. And that'll be fun for me um, to come up with something. But I mean, like I knew about this, you know, mission that I'd come up with. I mean, I rolled it three weeks before I actually ended up running it. And I didn't write down anything new about what I was going to do. I decided on it's probably in a row house where he where he's hiding out, but that was all I decided. So you can watch the session yourself to judge whether I should have come up with more or whether that was just enough. I don't know. That's it's kind of up to you. Um, but yeah, that's my GM prep. I think. Um, I think. I think I'm gonna try to continue to do these as we go forward. Um, I think they're interesting. I think it's something you don't get to see often. Um, we can all read the GM advice in the books and we can all GM ourselves to learn, you know, to gain that experience. I'm definitely way past my thousand hours for mastery on GMing. Uh, in fact, I think I realized today that 2017 is actually my 30th year GMing, I think, which is crazy and, and I hate it, um, <laughs> but yeah. I've been doing this a long time, but it's only really recently that you can watch someone else do GM prep, you know, on this here old internet thing. So that's just what I'm trying to do is just, you know, see how someone else does it. Um, adjust your methods based on what I do. Do it better than me. Do it worse than me. I don't know. We can all learn from watching someone else do stuff. Um, so that's sort of my hope with this series is just, you guys can watch and maybe learn. I'm not huge into giving GM advice or anything just because every game group is different. Every situation often ends up being different, but just having a practical example, I think is very useful and helpful. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, hope you enjoy it. If you do hit like subscribe to the channel. Um, Follows on the Twitch for the next time we do this live, uh, which will be next Thursday. We are going to be running. I think I'm going to be down a player, but there's still a bunch of other players, so it'll all work out. Um, yeah, so next Thursday, uh, 7 p.m. Mountain time, Mountain Standard, Mountain Daylight. Are we in Daylight Savings Time still? I have no idea. <laughs> 7 o'clock Mountain. Um, but yeah, be sure to like the channel, subscribe to the channel. Um, you can follow us on Twitter where we, uh, definitely post, you know, that we're about to go live when these videos go up. So you can uh, keep track that way too. And, uh, our Patreon is up. If you want to throw any money our way, we certainly appreciate it. Um, there's some cool equipment that I would like to get that would make this easier to do. Um, we can only do that through your gaming dollars. So thanks very much for watching. Bye.